Hello people of the internet, my name is Brooks Hitzfield with Seven Sons and in this video we're going to be talking about steak. So if you don't eat a lot of meat or consider yourself a steak connoisseur, knowing which cut to buy or even what makes a good steak can be pretty confusing and sometimes even intimidating. It's like shopping at that fine dining restaurant and everything on the menu you can't pronounce, but you know you could spend a lot of money and still come out with a very poor experience. So I want to make sure that doesn't happen to you the next time you go to shop for steak. So I have the grill firing up here and six different cuts inside. So let's go take a close look at each one and we're going to learn something and take the stress out of this once and for all. And yes, there are slight showers out behind me, but I've been waiting for grilling season for a long winter. And I'm sure some of you barbecue pitmasters can share some empathy for my excitement. All right, I have the cuts sitting here on this barrel, and we'll dive into each one and learn, learn something about them. But first, I want to quickly address two common myths that are associated to grass-fed beef. If you know us at Seven Sons, we raise all of our animals out on pasture, and I know you've heard it said from a family member or a friend that, one, grass-fed beef is too lean. Now, unfortunately, that could have been an experience that they had because early beef that was marketed as grass-fed was often just old dairy cattle, which would have been much lower quality and could have been leaner. They're bred for milk production, not beef. And on the grain finished side, that's on the other side here, the animals, they're raised in confinement feedlots, so they're not getting a lot of exercise compared to grass-fed beef, so the muscles aren't being worked. They're being fed high starch diets, okay, mostly corn and soy, which is essentially just carbohydrates. And we know what happens when we eat a lot of carbohydrates, we put on the weight very quickly. So that's how that, you know, that fat content is being achieved on the grain fed side. Now, we can be a lot smarter about the way that we raise grass fed and grass finished animals out on pasture. Okay, we need to be selective about a couple of things. The forages that we're raising, so the type of grasses that we have out on pasture need to be higher energy grasses, so they have a higher natural sugar content. So that's essentially just good carbohydrates, right? We know about those versus bad carbohydrates. So we want to be selective about the forages that we're grazing. We also want to be selective about the rotation of our cattle throughout the land that we're grazing to make sure that we're grazing that grass at the optimal time when it does have its, you know, it's at its point in time where it does have the highest energy. So that's typically before, without getting too technical, typically that's before it goes to seed head, before you start to see the seeds right at the top, just like wheat. So that's, so on the grass fed side, you can achieve a higher fat content that still tastes great, has that high flavor from the marbling. Um, and it's very tender. And we've even had people look at our beef before and s accuse us of feeding the animals grain because they're used to that, possibly that old dairy grass-fed beef, which would have been much leaner compared to what we're able to achieve. So that's uh, myth number one. Uh, number one. Here's myth number two, and it's that grass-fed beef tastes gamey. Now, again, this one's really easy. We go back to early grass-fed beef, which a lot of times would have been the dairy cattle, which were older animals and they could have had that gamier taste, similar to deer meat and venison, okay? So those are the two myths. I'm taking a stand for grass-fed beef for obvious reasons. Now we can dive into each cut and make sure that you learn something new. All right, so here's the different cuts that we have. I wanna talk about uh, a couple of the things that we're looking at that determines the tenderness and really the quality of the steak. Uh, you heard me talking earlier about the fat marbling um, here, and I'll just pick up this one to show you what I'm talking about. When the fat marbling is that inner muscular fat, so this, you know, kind of these specks throughout the muscle, okay? That's what kind of breaks up the muscle fibers and the connective tissue um, that, you know, make that steak very tender. So this, this is an excellent cut there. And the other thing you're going to be looking for that you can't really tell visually, but the amount of connective tissue in the muscle, which is usually determined by... Um, how much that muscle is utilized. So on the cattle, if the muscle doesn't get worked very often, then that muscle is going to have less connective tissue and then therefore be more tender. And on that note, I wanna kinda highlight our, our most popular cut first, and that's the filet mignon. So a lot of times you'll hear this referred to as a tenderloin steak because it comes from the tenderloin of the animal. And again, this is going to be a cut that is, um, is very, um, it's not utilized by, by the, the cattle much, so that means there's not as much connective tissue. Very, very tender. This is usually going to be your most expensive cut, um, but you definitely can't go wrong with a filet mignon. So the next one I'm going to highlight again is this, uh, the Delmonico steak. So this is often referred to as a ribeye or a rib steak if it has the bone in. 
And um, again, this has a lot of that intermuscular fat and the marbling. Um, this is one of my favorite steaks. You definitely can't go wrong with a ribeye. Another thing that's really great about the ribeye is that um, it's usually cut very consistently. So there's no thinner part of the steak that's you know thicker than the other. So what that means is that it's much easier to cook very evenly. So you can't go wrong with a, a ribeye. It's the next one that's going to usually be around a similar price as the ribeye is the New York strip. So this also has great, um, typically some great fat marbling in the steak. And it's easy to identify because of this, this fat belt that it has along one side. Okay. And depending who you are, you might want to cut that off after it's cooked um, or, um, or a lot of people would like that as well. It has lots of flavor. It can sometimes help hold in the juices since it kind of follows along on one side. So in my opinion, the, uh, the Demonica is going to be more tender, but this is definitely a very popular cut. Again, it's very consistent in its size and uh, easy to cook. Uh, one thing about the Delmonico, uh, that's again, you're going to, it's often referred to as a ribeye. You're going to see it on our website as a Delmonico. And uh, we also sell it with the bone in. And at that point, we refer to it as a tomahawk uh, ribeye. So basically what it, it looks like with the steak that comes out off on one side, it has that shape of a tomahawk. So those are the three, you know, some of the three most popular steaks and usually the most highest cost. And once you start moving down the line, we kind of have a steak in the middle, and that's what we refer to as the sirloin. Now, this one is actually probably the most popular cut in North America. It's usually more economical than the first three that we mentioned, but still very, uh, very good taste tasting beef. Not as much um, intermuscular fat, so not as much marbling, so not quite as tender, but the thickness is even, so that makes it easy to cook as well. Um, and a very, very good cut for the value. Then we're gonna, what I'm gonna do is, is talk about these last three cuts last and they're, they're less popular. Um, if you can tell by their shape what they are, then I would consider you a meat connoisseur, but they're very, very good. Um, you don't get as much from each animal, so a lot of times you'll only see them in butcher shops, so they're not nearly as common to find, but in excellent cuts of beef. The first one here is the skirt steak, and you can usually uh, very, if you know uh, your cuts, you can tell by the distinct shape of the muscle fibers, which run uh, very perpendicular to the cut. Now, the skirt steak is, is very thin. It's a longer cut, um, which means it could be, you just definitely got to watch yourself when you're cooking it, so it, it's a lot easier to overcook because it's not nearly as thick. Um, but you, as you can see, there's a lot of fat on this one, and typically I might even trim some of this, um, some of the um, the larger chunks of fat off um, because that doesn't quite have um, that can that can cause something to be in there that's a little bit more uh, chewy or sinewy. So I might trim it up a little bit because this one has more fat content on it than usual. But still, um, great intermuscular fat, very very tender cut. This is actually my favorite cut of steak. I believe it's incredibly underrated. Now, again, it can be harder to cook and also harder to cut because for most of these other steaks, they're cut along um, the muscle fibers. So the muscle fibers run this way with the steak. So they're cut kind of along the side and that makes it easier to chew, easier to cut, um, where that's the opposite for the skirt steak there. So you, you know, kind of, you, a lot of times you'll see people struggle with this steak but as long as you know what you're doing, you're gonna to want to cut the steak perpendicular to the grain of the meat. So the muscle fibers are all running this way. And if you use your knife to cut alongside of it um, down the long end here, it's gonna be much more tender and easier to chew. So since it's a long steak, what I'll do is usually cut it in half and that way it makes it easier to slice down the middle. So we keep moving on. Something on the other side here is what we call the hanging tender. This is a smaller one and the size of the hanging tender will often vary from the animal, the size of the animal. And again, we don't get very much of this from each animal, so it's pretty rare to find, but another great cut of beef. It's uh, very similar to the skirt steak as in that the, um, the muscle fibers kind of run a uh, long ways with it, but it does often have a lot of intermuscular fat very, very tender. It's thicker than the skirt steak, so um, it can be a little bit more consistent to cook, but as you can see, the shape of it isn't real consistent, so some sides you can dry out while other sides still end up at that medium rare, so you, we want to be careful sometimes. Last one we're going to highlight is what we call the flat iron. So as you can see on this steak, we still have um, you know, great um, intermuscular fat that kind of runs 
um, long ways with with the the cut but this is this is a very tender cut and it's going to be around a similar value as the skirt and the hanging tender um, a lot of people enjoy the flat iron and it's very uh, versatile so a lot of people like to marinate it and season it different ways to include in different dishes some folks will slice it they include it in uh, um, um, cheesesteak sandwiches and stir fry very versatile and um, um, always got to love the flat iron so All right, so those were the different steaks I had to highlight for you. Of course, there are many more, but we got to see a selection of the higher, you know, higher cost, higher value cuts and a selection of the lower end cuts. But we've learned that the fat marbling is the main thing you can see visually that helps determine the tenderness. And we saw that on both sides. They're all great cuts of meat, in my opinion. The main thing that's gonna determine the difference is how easy they're to work with, especially on the grill and on the plate. So the New York Strip, Delmonico and Ribeye, those are more consistent, so they're gonna be harder to overcook easier to cut so if you're just getting started with steak you don't have a lot of experience i would recommend starting there but when you're ready to branch out to something new and some more diverse flavors some of those other ones that we mentioned are going to be a, a great place for you to explore so i hope you guys learned something and next time that you approach steak you have more confidence that was the goal of the video now i'm getting hungry so we're going to throw some of these guys on the grill uh, i'll leave you with a couple cooking tips when you're cooking a steak and you pull it off the grill or the burner be sure to let it rest, okay? At least almost 10 minutes, okay? Because when you cook meat, it puts it under a lot of stress. And if you cut into it right away, you'll lose a lot of that moisture and the juices. So if you let it rest, I know it's tempting, but let it rest for 10 minutes and the experience is gonna be much better. Also, whatever internal temperature you're shooting for, so for medium, rare, or well done, pull it off five degrees before it reaches that point because it's gonna continue to cook afterwards, okay? So that's, that's something that's easy to miss. If you're cooking a steak inside, be sure to look up the um, reverse searing method. That's basically where you utilize um, your oven to help bring the steak up to temperature. It's an excellent way to do it if you can't use a grill. So again, I hope you guys have learned something. I really appreciate you watching and until next time.